God's love. Elevating, energizing, empowering. Miracles happen when you know that you are loved. Peter Youngren has communicated God's love with millions from every religion and culture. Get ready for your ultimate life because you are loved. Welcome today. God is life. And in these times where there's so much talking about death, 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 pandemic, viruses, uh, you, you know, problems are spiking in society, uh, suicide rate, uh, people who die of, of uh, related to opioid and uh, other drug abuse, uh, overdoses, it, it's spiking. Domestic abuse, uh, we hear that it's spiking. God is life. There is resurrection life for you. Uh, Christ come to give us life, that we may have life through Him. And so I want to take you now to a teaching where I talked about this, and I think you will be encouraged, you will be strengthened, and then later on I'm going to talk to you uh, about some prophetic insights that I shared for 2020, and then we're also going to pray together. I'm going to believe God for you today to experience His life and His health and His protection. But right now, let's go to the teaching about this resurrection life of Christ. I read from Luke chapter 24, verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they were greatly perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. You know, the resurrection of Jesus is maybe the greatest teaching of the New Testament. It's mentioned 104 times. It was very contentious. You find time and time and again in the scriptures when Paul and the others, for example, when Paul was in Athens, it seemed the crowd was quite willing to listen to him until he began to speak about the resurrection from the dead, and it caused this great debate. Some today say, well, you know, there are lots of stories of people who rose from the dead, Lazarus, Dorcas, there are people who were raised from the dead in the Bible. Yeah, but there's a big difference. Jesus rose to endless life, endless life. Those others who were raised from the dead, they died again. I, you know, sometimes I wonder if we had the technology 2,000 years ago of a motion sensor uh, or a light or a motion sensor camera, if it had been positioned outside the tomb, what would the resurrection of Jesus have looked like? I guess none of us can say for sure, but I don't think it would have looked like somebody kind of just sitting up in bed who had been sleeping or dead and kind of coming out. I, I think it looked more like a beam of light, that he who is the light of the world, like a beam of light, he came through that stone and, and, and rose again. He, he was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. You know, the resurrection is such a, an, an occurrence that it must be explained. History must be explained why things turned out like they did. People say, oh, there's stories of people who rose from the dead. Yeah, but, but history must be explained. How a few disciples, Galilean, from the outback somewhere, how they turned the world upside down. What happened? They told others, and then they went out, and it says God confirmed the word that they spoke about the living Jesus with miracles. It says in one place, God gave witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ by the hands of the apostles and the believers, and that's what we are believing for today. As you listen to me, I'm speaking on resurrection openings. First, of course, is we, we understand this is part of it. The tomb opened. We read about that. You know, tombs are so in important in religion and history. You have Buddha's tomb. You have the Valley of the King and the pyramids in, in, in Luxor and in, outside of Cairo, Egypt. And these are all great edifices to, uh, as a tomb to commemorate someone's life. 
Taj Mahal was built uh, in honor uh, to remember a beautiful woman. The gospel is signified by an empty tomb. They found the tomb open. And, and what's interesting in the Bible is that there are so many little details in the story. It doesn't just say that Jesus rose from the dead. That would be good in and of itself, but there's so many details. For example, the Roman seal, that the grave where Jesus Christ was put into, it was sealed by a Roman seal. Now, now you, we understand that by Roman law, to break that seal was punishable by death. It, it makes the story that somehow the, the disciples broke into the tomb and told, stole the body. Do you really think it's credible that timid disciples would commit an act worthy of punishment by death? Don't think so. What about the guards? You know, the story was that the guards fell asleep when they said somebody stole the body, which is kind of ridiculous, because how did they know that if they were asleep? Secondly, to fall asleep while on guard duty was punishable by death. And, and, and so would, the, would they really be, be falling asleep? Or would they have been paid off? You know, to, 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 to be derelict of their duty was punishable by death. And, and so that doesn't make sense. The body, it, the disciples stealing the body, how would these timid Galilean disciples muster enough courage to overpower the guards, roll away the stone and steal the body? It doesn't make sense. The story of the twelve. How did those 12, as I said, turn the world upside down? Well, what gave them the power? 12 became 500, and, 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 and how did they have such inner strength to preach the living Jesus if it was just a lie? Would they not have given up? Would they not have surrendered? They were willing, and history records that they died, except for one of them, they died the death of a martyr. Would they really die for something they thought was a lie? No, something happened. History must be explained. Now, I could look at all those details, and that doesn't in, in and of itself prove the story, but it, it gives me food for thought. I know Jesus Christ is alive because I've seen him at work in me and in others. You know, in my campaigns around the world, I often preach a sermon called, How I Know That Jesus Christ Is Alive because he does today what he did 2,000 years ago. The tomb is open. The Bible opened. Do you know, to some people today, the Bible is still a closed book. And, 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 and it doesn't have to be, but to many it is. It, it says like this in 2 Corinthians 3, Paul writes, For unto this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, there's a veil that remains unlifted, but it is removed in Christ. To this day when Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. Well, when a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So what Paul is addressing here, and it's still a problem today, that many don't understand the Bible. They even quote things in the Bible, but they don't really understand it. It was only after the resurrection that there was a, an opening of the Scripture. They understood what it was all about. Let me tell you, in Luke 24, Jesus is speaking there to the disciples, and he says, in verse 27, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. A few verses later, all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. This is after the resurrection. The scriptures open up. You know, the Bible can just seem like a good ancient book with, with wise sayings and wisdom nuggets. But after the resurrection, Jesus opens it up. And so, for example, the story of Isaac, how he was put on the altar on Mount Moriah, and then God provided a lamb so that Isaac didn't have to die, and he and his father Abraham came back on the third day. Well, that's a picture of Jesus Christ who actually became the sacrifice for the sins of the world. And on the third day, he rose again. The story of Joseph, it, it comes alive. It's not just a story of a person, but Joseph, just like Jesus, suffered innocently. He was thrown into the pit, just like Jesus went to hell to proclaim victory. And he was raised again 
to glory, Joseph to be the prime minister of Egypt, Jesus to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jonah, three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, picture of Jesus' death and resurrection, the story of the scapegoat, where the people symbolically put, or the priests put the people's sins on the scapegoat and the scapegoat was, was sent into the wilderness. It comes alive. It's not just a story of some strange ritual from thousands of years ago. It becomes alive because that's Jesus Christ. My sins, he carried them far, far away. And so the whole Bible comes alive by the resurrection. The, the fourth man in the fiery furnace in the story of Daniel, that's Jesus Christ. Psalm 23, the great shepherd, that's Jesus Christ. The scriptures come alive. Oh, so many people still don't understand that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the Scriptures. We don't follow Elijah or Moses or David as wonderful as those people may have been. We follow Jesus Christ. I, I sometimes have to smile at my Christian friends. They are praying for Elijah's anointing and Elisha's anointing. And I say, why do you want those people's anointing? They want the anointing you have. You have Jesus Christ is in you. Resurrection life is in you. The power that raised Christ from the dead is in you. Don't go longing for something that's less than what you have. You have Christ in you. And so the Bible opens up to us. And you know, there's some very strange things in the Bible. You read some strange stories. But Jesus here tells us what you need to do when you read the Bible. He says, you need to find me. The Psalms and the Law of Moses and the Prophets speak about me. So suddenly, reading the Old Testament, you know, so-and-so begat so-and-so. So I know it can get a little boring. Some of the stories are just uh, amazing. But suddenly you say, I'm on a treasure hunt because Jesus rose from the dead. I understand this is full of pictures prophecies, illustrations of Jesus Christ, the different rituals that were performed by, by the priest in the Old Testament, but it's actually a picture of Jesus. It reveals Jesus so that Jesus Christ is like a multifaceted diamond. And when you look at a diamond, you know, if you look at it this way or that way, it, it sparkles differently. And so there's so many facets of this diamond called the living Jesus. Jesus' resurrection didn't just open up the tomb. It opens up everything. You know, religion is about things being so closed in, so tight, just our little group. But Jesus' resurrection opens up life, abundant life, eternal life for the whole world. I, I just could go on and on on that point I was making there about how the Bible opens up. You, you know, when you read the Bible, especially uh, Paul said to the Corinthians, he says, many of you read the Old Testament and, and you don't understand it. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, you, you don't understand what you're reading. And that's true today. And so we need to filter it through what Jesus Christ has done. You know, there's some strange things people say sometimes mindlessly. Oh, Pastor Peter, whatever the Word of God says, whatever the Bible says, I just believe that. That's what I want to do. Really? You know, it says about the young David, who was to be the great king of Israel, that uh, when he was going to marry Saul's daughter, he killed 200 Philistines and gave the foreskins of those Philistines to his future father-in-law as a dowry. That's in the Word. Well, yes, I didn't mean that. Well, I, I hope you don't do that. We'll have to visit you in prison. I mean, people, we, we all know that, that some things that are written in the Old Testament are a little bit out there. And so we're not supposed to practice all of that. You're not supposed to stone rebellious children at the city gate. Well, well so we all know that some things are not for us. So what we do when we read the Old Testament, we see it through Jesus. And Jesus helped us here in Luke 24 so that the reading of the Old Testament Scriptures will be like a treasure hunt. We see prophecies. We see illustrations. We see rituals. And we see different stories. And we say, oh, these reveal Jesus Christ to me. Oh, I tell you, I hope you'll get, I have lots more teaching on that. Uh, the Bible code, maybe they'll put that a little, if you want to listen to that teaching, several hours on explaining on how to read the Bible. 
I think it's called How to Read the Bible. I forget the title of that, but they'll put it down there on the lower part of the screen so you can order that teaching. But also I want to say to you, we have lots of good things for you. I hope you're receiving our magazine. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the winter 2020 issue and lots of different articles and teachings and, and you know, um, lots of materials that you will enjoy and stories, uh, testimonies, uh, all kinds of great things. And so get this nice publication that comes into your home four times a year, totally free. We're just seeding that into your life. So go ahead and get that. And um, also I want to mention that uh, on New Year's Eve leading into this year, I preached this message, Prophetic Insights for the 2020s. It actually became uh, three messages. There's three CDs on this. And I really encourage you to get a hold of this particular teaching. And now when I s sit here with a few months after I proclaim this, I can say that I, I, it was amazingly accurate. What I said was going to happen in the 2020s, this decade, frankly, some of the things have happened in the first few months. I didn't necessarily expect everything to be so evident right away. Uh, but, but get a hold of this teaching, and it also has a very positive teaching about something that's going to happen in the realm of economics. There is a wealth transfer happening, so there's a lot of things that are negative, and we talk about those, but there's a lot of positives as well. So go ahead and order that teaching, and I hope the information is there on the screen. I'll remind you when we, before we the end as well about that, because it's a very, very time-sensitive uh, album that you'll, it'll be worth your time and attention. Well, let's go back right now to another little nugget from this teaching about how the resurrection opens up everything to a new life. Here we go. Hell opened. <laughs> Isn't that something? Revelation 1, 18, Jesus says, Do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of Hades and of death. You know, uh, one of the words translated hell is the word Hades, the Greek word Hades, which means the kingdom of, of death. And, and, and the Bible makes it very clear that Jesus went to Hades, and he took the keys of death and hell. We can say with absolute certainty, hell has been plundered. This is not some new concept I'm bringing you. This was well known all down through the church history. The church fathers preached this and, and, and again and again. And in fact, I think it's been a little bit forgotten in our day. You know, there's an old English expression. It's called, they call this the harrowing of hell. The harrowing of hell. I put it there, maybe on the, you can see it. Harrowing, so as, as an old, what does that mean? Well, harrowing means raking. You know, it's like a picture, a huge rake with, with long prongs, sharp prongs. And it's like, like, like the, the old church fathers would say, it's like Jesus went to hell and he harrowed it. He raked it out. He, he, he set the people free. You know, our Greek uh, Orthodox friends and Russian Orthodox and other Orthodox Christians, we, we celebrated a Good Friday when we think about the rest of, of the cross of Jesus. And then we have Easter Sunday. But, you know, to the Orthodox, they also celebrate... Holy Saturday. They have a special mass, a special service on Saturday morning called Holy Saturday. What is that all about? Because to many people who are Protestant, Baptists, Pentecostals, you, you, you are very solemn on Good Friday, and then Sunday you're celebrating, but uh, Saturday is for going shopping or something to fill up your cupboards again. Well, uh, our Orthodox friends, they have Holy Saturday. And, and it's for this very reason. They, they commemorate how Jesus went to hell. And he, as it says in Ephesians, he led captivity captive. He preached to those who were in hell. He preached a, a message of good news. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. And, and, and let me just quote a couple of verses about this. It says in Matthew 27, verse 51, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holiest city and appeared to many. So when Jesus came out of hell, he obviously brought some folks with him. 
that had died believing in the Messiah that would come. First Peter talks about this verse, chapter 3, verse 19. Christ also went and preached to the spirits in prison. Here hell is referred to as a prison. Hades is a prison. And so, you see, hell has been defeated. The devil has been defeated. Don't make so much out of the devil. You, you know, some people, they, some Christians, I, I warn you, you talk too much about what the devil is doing. Talk about what Jesus has done, that, 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 that he put the devil under our feet. So today when we, we, people die, they don't, you don't go to Hades. You're instantly in the presence of God. And, and so if, if you lost a loved one, if, if, if when you die, when I die, we'll be instantly in the presence of God. You know, this truth that I'm teaching here, and of course I'm under some time limitations. I was teaching that for our church family, and it also went on uh, different social media platforms worldwide, but I was, you know, keeping to a certain time restriction. This is an area that I, I'm amazed how many Christians know little or some almost nothing about because it was a very big thing in the early church, in the, for the first centuries of the church. It's part of the, you know, the earliest confessions of our faith. We talk about this, and, and yet many seem to not know about it. One of the scripture verses, I'll read it to you. I think I alluded to it. I just mentioned it in bypassing. But it says in, in Ephesians 4, it says, He ascended on high, He led captivity, captives, and he gave gifts unto men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean? Except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth. This is why they refer to Hades, the lower parts of the earth. And then he who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all heavens. And then he talks about how he gave gifts to people, the various ministry gifts. You know, some of the early depictions of the resurrection literally shows Jesus with the keys of death and hell in one hand and then with his other hand he is reaching down to fallen Adam, fallen humanity, fallen uh, humankind and pulls us out of that death, out of that destruction. I, in fact I have a picture which is a, a picture that was more common in the first early th thousand years of the church. You'll see it there. I think our producer will get it up and it shows Jesus Christ triumphing. Some of these pictures shows, you know, demonic powers under Jesus' feet. We, we need to understand that hell has been defeated. So for so many, as I said of my Christian friends, there's so much talking about hell, so much talking about the devil, 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 demon, demon, demon. These have been defeated by Jesus. And so we have a positive, victorious, joyous message to share with the world. And that's what we are doing. Because all over the world, uh, people uh, have this fear of death. That's what people struggle with. Doesn't matter what religion they are, fear of death. So I want to invite you to come and receive the gift of God's salvation. I, if you want to receive this gift of God's life and some more on this point, I'm going to hold this up here. We want to send you these little booklets here and you can see information on the screen how you can receive them. The one of them, the enlightenment booklet, you can download and, and all that information is right there. I let it just sit there for a little bit and uh, you can just jot that down. Make sure you receive that or you can call me, you can text me, with your prayer requests, you see all that, you've probably seen that throughout the program, the text numbers there, and, uh, and, and, and we want to bless you in that way. Now, we are focused on getting the gospel to everyone, and I'm grateful for those who have become partners with us, but right now, this has been a tough time, and I'm believing God for many new partners. Look at this about what the VIP family partnership is all about. <music> We know who we are. We know our purpose, to pass on the love and mercy of Jesus Christ to others. We did not receive God's grace to keep it to ourselves, but to share it with the world. And we do more together than any one of us could do alone. We are the VIP family. Our high honor is to serve, 
to stand with other believers in faith, sacrifice, and compassion. We are old and young, male and female. We live in apartments and in private homes. Some of us just entered the workplace and others are retired. We are widows or widowers. We are the VIP family. We live in big cities and rural towns. We work on farms and in retail. Some of us are professionals, some factory workers, some teachers, pilots, pastors, drivers, social workers, electricians and plumbers, home workers and students. We are the VIP family. Most of all, we are co-workers with Jesus Christ in the greatest task ever given, to give the gospel to every person. We have provided follow-up for more than 17 million new believers. We have trained more than 375,000 pastors and leaders. We operate Bible schools on three continents. We broadcast the gospel through television, books, and tracts. We are the VIP family, and our work has just begun. Now, we invite you. Jesus needed the 12, the 70, and the 500. Paul had a team of co-workers, and you are needed in this great task to finish the assignment that Jesus gave, that every person will be able to hear and receive the gospel. If not now, then when? If not you, then who? Say yes today to join the VIP family. Call 416-745-1820 or go online, give.peteryoungren.org. To say yes to join the VIP family, which is all about advancing the gospel, it really could be your gift to the world, uh, to a world that is hurting, to a world that needs good news. Uh, let's give them that. Let's give give them what Jesus said. They must have. This gospel must first be preached to all nations. This was what Jesus said so clearly. So thank you. Your help and participation is much needed right now. Please go to your telephone and you see the information there and, and respond uh, either to join the VIP family or give a your very best gift. We have 18 more campaigns coming up this year. Bible schools, a lot missionaries are working around the world. And the very best, if you could join the VIP family and also share a special gift right now. And then remember the prophetic insights for the 2020s album. I had no idea when I spoke this a few months ago how much of this would already be fulfilled in the first few months of this year. God bless you. Keep calling us. You are loved. Thank you. Your participation makes this global gospel ministry possible. To share your prayer request or to help bring the gospel to those who have never heard it, call 416-745-1820. You can give at www.peteryoungren.org or send your gift to World Impact Ministries at P.O. Box 62039, RPO, Victoria Terrace, North York, Ontario, M4A2W1, or P.O. Box 433, Winchester, Kentucky, 40392-9800. Together, let's give everyone a chance to know God's love in Jesus Christ.